Today's video is brought to you by Factor. Factor is, in my opinion, the most excellent and best tasting meal service plan out there. Many of you know that in addition to this current channel, I also have a second channel, a Twitch stream, I am on Adeptus Ridiculous, and I am taking over Dice Check with fellow buddy Demeki. I don't have a lot of time for lots of other things, cooking especially. And Factor, out of all the meal services out there, I think does the best job at combining proper macros, good tasting food, and easy accessibility. In the background, you can see me heating up two different kinds of factor meals for myself. They're both excellently flavorful, meet my macros well, and they heat up in an incredibly short period of time, only about two minutes. The funny thing is, Factor sent me six meals for this video, and I already ate four of them before filming this ad because I think they taste really good and it worked really well with my schedule. It's hard to, to give a more glowing review than I ate them too quickly, I didn't have time to film them. It's also lovely that they have so many different kinds of choices. High protein, an option. Low calorie, an option. They even have a brand new gourmet meal service as well. So if you simply want to save a lot of time and meet your goals for fitness, whether that be bulking, cutting, or just maintaining really well, I think Factor has an option for you. And I would highly recommend you go down in the description, click the link to factor75.com and use code BRICKY50 for 50% 50 off your first order. Again, that's the description, Factor 75, code BRICKY50 for 50% 50 off your first order. Thank you so much, Factor, for sponsoring this video, and let's talk about Big Mech. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Bricky. Currently watching my heart sink as one squad of Mustangs eliminates my entire Air Force. If you're curious about the shirt, by the way, I'll let you know more about it at the end of the video. For the most part, I skipped the auto battler craze. I didn't play Dota's auto chess, I didn't play TFT, and I hadn't touched any game that could be technically considered as an auto battler. But I did play a game that had a custom game you could call an auto battler. StarCraft II, in particular, Wings of Liberty, had a custom map and mode called Direct Strike. Oh lord, forgiveness upon my soul, did I play an insane amount of Direct Strike. It was one of the main games I played after finishing a closing Dairy Queen shift and showering off the, the caked on grease and cream from my face and jorts. Oh yeah, when I worked at Dairy Queen, uh, we didn't have to do the flip thing. It was like optional and I never did. Those of you who work at a Dairy Queen right now, how in the world do you make a banana split blizzard and it not all come out? I have to know your secret because I could never get that to work for goddamn ingredients. Now, I won't lie. I didn't really know what auto chests or auto battlers really were. If you told me that they were like direct strike when they came out, I actually probably would have played it. But the, the neurons in my brain just weren't firing properly and didn't put two and two together and too much Dairy Queen grease. For those who don't know, auto battlers or auto chess, two names, same thing. It's a form of strategy game that relies heavily on strategic thinking and counterplay. And by heavily, I mean entirely. A real-time strategy game centers a lot of its initial learning curve on like mechanical skill. Your actions per minute, your unit micro, your speed with production and hotkeys. All that stuff. Some games put a lot of emphasis on this, like StarCraft, for example, and some put a little less, like Command and Conquer. Don't get me wrong, they're all micro-intensive, but you know, it varies. Auto battlers don't have any form of mechanical skill whatsoever. The map is blank with deployment zones for both players. Units are deployed in areas and locations on your side, and then slowly advance towards the enemy at well, I guess various speeds and directions. They then will fight each other without any input from you as a player, and what enemies they target, what directions they go, it's all up to predetermined paths and how the AI is directed. The skill of the game comes entirely from how you place your units, choose your units, and upgrade your army. And that is where Mechabellum has taken over my life. Not just my life, actually, but the life of my family and friends. People don't talk to me anymore. I'm not invited to parties. They invite a blank cardboard cutout of me with Mechabellum's box art taped to the face. My family wrote me out of the will and Mechabellum into it. I had a dog, but he ran away after I upgraded him with mechanical rage and replaced his fangs with the game's equivalent. Mechabellum took my kids and foreclosed my home. I can't stop playing. I just can't. We are getting 
two extremely addicting strategy games, one after the other. The beauty that this game has is that it's such a simple concept, yet it has me creaming my jorts with the level of strategy. Every time you think you're getting a handle on the game, it gives you a brand new way to get good at it. So to illustrate my examples, you, you need to understand how the game works. Like I said before, you place units in a deployment zone that consists of two towers. At the start, you select one of four specialists to pick from, and each specialist has a different starting health, starting units, and ability. The health you will get is tied to the specialist you choose, but the units you start with are mostly random. For example, you might start with speed specialist, where your whole army gets plus three movement speed. Start with something like 3,900 health or so, and get steel balls and fangs for your initial units. Now, when you have a unit you got this round, you can move them to wherever you want them to be. Perhaps steel ball in the middle, fangs in the back. How about some spooky tunneling crawlers in the front or mustangs on the side? So long as it's the same round, you can place them anywhere. But the moment that round starts, they are locked in and for the most part can't be moved for the entire rest of the game barring some exceptions. Once you start the round, your opponent's decisions are revealed to you and you advance towards each other heads high and mechanical feet pounding, ready to murder each other in a nice straight line like the founding fathers intended. The loser is the one who has all of their units destroyed and will take damage equal to however many units the winner has left. So if the victory was that the tiniest silver scrapes, then the loser will only take a teeny little bit of damage. If it was a catastrophic loss though, I mean, that's a lot of damage. Then the next round starts and two things happen. Firstly, you get to recruit more friends, if you want to, that is. Four specialist cards will arrive and you and your opponent get the exact same cards every round. Some are free, some cost supply, and some cost lots of supply. And they can give you things like game long benefits or major support powers. Now, supply is the big number on the bottom right that basically equates to how much money you have. Each new round has you getting an ever increasingly larger amount of supply, and you can spend it on all sorts of things. New units, for example, can be researched to allow for future purchases, but you can only ever purchase two units around. So you can't save up a ton of money and spam 16 squads of crawlers to burrow into your opponent's butthole despite the temptation. You can spend it on those specialists I mentioned prior or perhaps some upgrades on your current units. See, each unit has four total upgrades you can choose from and some of these are staggeringly powerful but often fetch a high price. A popular one for crawlers is Replicate, which allows enemies destroyed by crawlers to create even more crawlers. Or how about and its ability to summon four wasps, a lower level unit but every single 28 seconds into the round. Or if you aren't feeling too saucy with upgrades, why not level them up? Units can gain veteran status by killing large amounts of the enemy and gaining experience. They gain enough, they can be leveled up, which is always half the cost of summoning the unit in the first place. Leveling up will increase their health and damage by their base amount multiplied by their level. So if a crawler, say, did 50 damage and it has 100 health, becoming level 2 would give it 100 damage and 200 health, with level 3 being 150 damage and 300 health. Which, if you are someone who is good at understanding this kind of math, like I have become learning about modifiers to hit in Warhammer, Eldar. This shows that going from level one to level two is the largest increase in power, literally doubling its power. From there, you get somewhat diminishing returns, but those are still returns. And some units at high levels can become such a problem to deal with, it makes it always worth the upgrades. Lastly, you have your tower upgrades, and these are split into two options. You have the tower of permanent upgrades and the tower of single round upgrades. The single round based upgrades last for, well, one round. Wow! and consist of rapid resupply, gaining 200 supply immediately, but costing you 300 to pay off next round, mass recruitment to recruit an additional unit this round, elite recruitment to automatically recruit level two units from the get-go, enhanced range for 15 more range army-wide, or mobility for three speed army-wide. These can really help you in a pinch if you're willing to shell out the money for them, but for something a bit more permanent, we have the other five options. Sticky oil bombs, uh, support 
teleport power that slows enemies for two rounds in a line, field recovery, the ability to destroy a squad and refund its entire cost and upgrade cost, mobile beacon, the ability to set a unit movement path and stop RNG from causing you too many issues, and finally, attack and defense enhancement, permanent army-wide 10% attack and 15% defense. Very helpful, and something I buy practically every game if I have the extra funds. Now you might be thinking to yourself, damn, Bricky, you've really been explaining a lot right now. Surely it's time to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong! How on God's green grass touching earth, something you won't be doing while playing this game, can we talk about Mecha Bellum without talking about, uh, you guessed it, Bells! <laughs> the mechs! There are 16 mechs available to you, and they have an insane variety of uses, upgrades, unit sizes, and strengths. Let's start small. The Humble Crawler. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? The Humble Crawler is one of those game starters and game ender units. It's a small melee unit that comes in as a horde. It runs at your enemy and starts to drill them to death. Ah, ah. The thing that makes crawlers so good is that they're fast and surprisingly high damaging when they get in close despite being so cheap. It also makes them crazy powerful when you upgrade them. Why not give them mechanical rage for faster movement and attack speed, subterranean assault a tunnel out of danger, Danger, or the best one, like I said, replicate. Turn dead things into more crawlers. And watch as the enemy's force drills them back. Ah! I'm your basic average girl, and I'm basic and I'm average. The Fang. It's a slower moving horde mech equipped with a regular little pew pew gun that can attack ground and air. The Fang is one of those like unassuming mechs that can be easily destroyed with a little bit of effort. But when they get going, oh, they will steamroll the entire opponent. Regular Fangs and upgraded Fangs have the biggest discrepancy in power out of all of the other units. I've won entire games by spamming Fangs, and even when my opponent texts to fight them, he still ends up losing. You can increase their range, their damage, movement speed, give them a portable shield to protect them. The Fang can be bought in mass for cheap harassment or even sacrificial troops, or they become an unstoppable horde killing things 40 times their size. Fang is love. Fang is life. It's all ogre now. The only time they're not being needlessly aggressive towards people, it's when they're off pissing, shitting, and vomiting all over their surroundings. The wasp. Much like real life wasps, they serve no purpose and they're dickheads. That's not really true. Uh, wasps are basically airborne fangs. Aircraft that are small, squishy, come in large squads and can attack air and ground. What really helps them out is the fact that they have every single upgrade imaginable. Give them energy shields, let them move between rounds, extra range, splash damage, ground specialization, air specialization, flaming shots, electromagnetic shots. I need a fucking shot. The wasp can be tooled out for anything, so long as whatever it's fighting can't deal with the airborne horde very well. It's going to destroy the Earth for the funny! Mustang, destroyer of galaxies. Speaking of destroying airborne horde well, uh, you, you guys remember in um, Command & Conquer 3, there was that GDI unit they added, the, the slingshot? Slingshot, eyes on the sky. Won't be fine for long, see you next Tuesday! Well, imagine like 20 of those guys. Unlike in Kane's Wrath, the Mustang can fire at air and ground and it's basically just an uncompromising amount of firepower directed at your soiled jorts. I have yet to find that many problems, specifically air problems, that aren't solved with enough Mustangs. Hordes get shredded under them, air gets shot down, and the only thing they can't seem to take out is armor, but even that's not really the case. It's specifically big, chunky armor, as long as it has an armor upgrade or something. Other than that, the Stangs are stallions. Give them increased range, give them increased damage, give them increased range and damage, specifically against air. And if that isn't enough, you can even have them shoot down missiles your opponent tries to use against you. Mustangs are insane. And I actually truly wonder if they're gonna be nerfed because, wow. <laughs> enough heat can be produced to literally burn a hole through balls. Try this at home, it smells like balls. Ball boys! So there are your horde options, but what if you want something a bit more specific? Something with a bit more chunk to it. How about the steel ball? The steel balls are actually not a crazy melee unit like they might appear, even though there is an upgrade that makes them explode into tiny little crawlers when they die. 
unrelated, steel balls actually have a beam that charges up its damage as they fire. The longer they shoot, the more it will begin to melt. And this truly doesn't have an end to it. Like if you let a steel ball boy fire at you for too long, you ain't going to be balling. He's got balls for days. He's going to crease your J's, Spider-Man. It will kill what it's shooting, but it's short range, so you can stop it before it gets too close. Of course, that can get difficult when it can, oh, I don't know, heal 60% of its damage dealt or link its health with other balls, keeping them alive or explode into crawlers or upgrade its armor or range. So, you know, don't lowball them. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm disappointed in myself. I'm a fucking tank. Understand me, son? You fucking bastard, yeah. You, you're a fucking bastard, mate. The sledgehammer. So steel balls had four total units. Sledgehammers have five. Sledgehammers are tanks. What do tanks do? Exactly what you think they're gonna do, dummy. I, I can't believe I have to say this. God damn you, just get your ass over here. Sledgehammers have longer range than balls, but fire in a more, well, tank-like nature. They're extremely consistent and I honestly think are heavily underrated. Their damage is solid, not exclusively anti-tank and not exclusively anti-horde, but it does have a little AoE blast, so it's good at both. It's a bit tanky, uh, but not insanely tanky. It's just a, a really consistent tank, good at almost everything, so long as it's ground and not air, and really good at being suited to whatever you want it to be suited for. Armor-piercing ammo, more range, faster fire rate, Sure, make the tank slap. Linked health sharing, health regen, armor scaling with level. Sure, make the tanks impossible to kill. A real connoisseur of tanks will appreciate the sledgehammer. Uh, much like a man appreciates like a revolver. It's not overly fancy. It's arguably not always the best tool for the job, but it's good, reliable, and simple. Which one of these birds sounds the most badass? The storm caller. So we've done close range balls and mid range tanks. But what mech base game can call itself proper without the advent of insane levels of artillery? Artillery, the storm caller certainly has. It's a long range platform that moves slowly, fires slowly, but fires a huge stream of rockets all over the opponent's position. As expected for artillery, the trade off of its massive range and damage is its overall slow fire rate and squishy nature. Like, these guys fold into pieces when they're targeted down and can't even fire at enemies right next to them. But this is the classic case of, yeah, I suck in melee. Too bad you'll never fucking get there. And hell, why not give them more range? Burn the ground beneath them, electrocute them, increase the AOE or decrease the range, but fire away faster. If it's on the ground and slow, the storm car can be used to remove it. I'm yellow. I'm red. I'm a bird. I don't really know how to make a bird noise. Hey. For the last of the multi-unit mechs, we have the Airborne Phoenix. Now, Phoenixes are a lot like snipers, but in the air. They shoot air and ground, come in pairs, and while firing slowly, can insta-kill most smaller level mechs with one shot. And like a phoenix from the ashes, when one dies, you can upgrade them with the ability to recover their cockpit and rebuild it back to life. Phoenixes are a unit that I have on multiple occasions been destroyed by, but never quite found out how to make them work. Like sometimes Phoenix spam has absolutely rolled me over, and other times I just built Mustangs and laughed as I rolled them over. Considering that much like wasps, they have every single upgrade under the sun, it really depends on how they're tooled up and what you want to support them with. We now move into single unit mechs, starting with the tried and true Arclight. The Arclight is an interesting archetype because it's a slow, medium range mech that fires a large AoE blast that is particularly nasty against hordes. One of these things can then turn a whole squad of fangs or crawlers into just wasted supplies and sludge. Much like many of the other mechs, it has a boatload of upgrades, but they're all just relatively simple. More range? Check. More damage? Check. Armor? Check. The fanciest one is the ability for it to shoot at aircraft, which can give it a great niche at killing annoying wasps in your face, but for now, Basically, if your opponent is spamming you, you bring the arc light. You know, it's cheap, it's effective, and it's got a got a cool big nose. Professionals have standards. Have a plan to kill everyone you meet. The biggest skill check in this game is how to deal with the proper uses of marksmen. They are bringers of salt in all kinds of ways. They work in the salt mines. They built the salty spittoon. They are a single unit, extremely high damage and long range sniper. Thing is, dealing with a 
sniper in this game is extremely simple. It shoots slow and at one target at a time. So just spam chaff, but then they kill your chaff with arc lights, for example, or aggro is pulled. And the next thing you know, a single marksman is shooting down everybody you love. It one shots phoenixes, arc lights, other marksmen, steel balls, sledgehammer tanks, and so on. It's single shot will put hurt on everything and it can go even farther. Electromagnetic shots, double shots to make sure it really dies. More range if you need that somehow. Or the most fun one, the shooting squad. Spawning five fangs instantly at the start of a round. A nice bit of chaff to stop enemies from getting to you too quickly. Marksmen's are beasts. And when played right, a bad player just won't be able to get through to them at all. Um, <clears throat> Skill issue. Uh, you see that wall? Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm gonna run. Oh, and then when I run through that wall, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, what are you gonna I'm do? I'm gonna run through the other wall. Wow. Remember when Paul Giamatti played the Rhino in Amazing Spider-Man 2? I try not to remember that the best I can. Yes! The Rhino is the exact opposite of the Marksman, and is when we start getting into some wackier options. It's a dedicated melee bot that runs at you with big saw hands and beats your ass. I mean, surely, what's there not to love? You might think I'm being hyperbolic or I'm underselling this boy, but I'm really not. He's chunky and a force to be reckoned with. His damage overall is just really outstanding. It's just a matter of getting him into combat. He can get health regen or wreckage recycling, allowing him to heal for the enemy's HP he kills. He can self-destruct and he has a special coating to make it so he has reduced damage and immunity to effects. And he can even Beyblade! I've ran Rhino Rushes, and let's just say if you are unprepared for him, he will just chop you up. Sorry, noob. You've just been hacked. And I am currently stationed at my secret hideout in Kyoto, Tokyo. Before we enter the realm of the big boys, we enter the realm of the weirdest mech of them all, the hacker. The hacker is part noob trap, part powerhouse. It's a funky tripod that slowly fills up the enemy mech's health bar and when it's full, will turn it to your side. The problem is that the hacker is single target and relatively squishy. And by relatively, I mean made of fucking paper. So if you want to keep it alive long enough to send things your way, it needs to be protected and given time. Like the Rhino, its upgrades are wacky. Range and electro attacks are one of it, but it can also give itself a giant barrier to protect itself and others. It can transfer its hacking ability to be multi-targeted. This makes it worse in terms of speed and range, but five beams at one time make for really nasty control abilities against the right targets. Or fully regen whatever you hack's health bar. I mean, it's pretty disgusting on giants. I mean, oh shit, speaking of giants. <laughs> Vulcan lives! For our final classification, we have giant units. Giant units are giant. I'm sure you're shocked to hear that. They cost a lot of recruitment, but are normally powerhouses in their respective fields. The Vulcan is your dedicated anti-horde giant because it has a flamethrower that would make any salamander peak with envy. Because once it's there, Hot Prometheum is spewed at any and all kinds of horde units like fangs, crawlers, and so on. They will just melt beneath your firestorm. You'll find that most giant bots have the issue of being focused down, so you can upgrade them in various ways to help with that, or just make them more murderous, like igniting the targets for damage over time, launching incendiary bombs across the map, give it more damage, give it more range, give it more armor, or just launch sticky oil bombs to slow down the enemies. So they spend more time in your destructive flame. You even got your best buddy. Summon a little marksman. You're my friend now. To help you out and deal with those pesky big boys as you kill the pesky small boys. Like Vulcan truly lives on as an anti-horde killer, but he's not the only big boy with a dedicated role. My super laser pass! How do you like that, Obama? I pissed on the moon, you idiot! The melting point used to be my beloved. A huge crab walker that would go forward with the exact same type of laser as the steel ball, charging up its damage the longer it fires. This is just on a much larger scale. The melting point will kill any and all bots almost instantly, and big bots like giants only take seconds longer to be destroyed. But much like our hacker friend, it is only single target and will have issues with hordes. That being said, I found some pretty hilarious ways to make it stronger. For a while, I used to run an extremely infuriating build where you would give it 60% lifesteal, extra range, and the same five target laser attack the hacker gets. So it would walk up and kill all kinds 
of small and big targets at once and be nearly unkillable as it tanked everything that was thrown at it because it was constantly siphoning damage from others. But if that isn't enough, it can also fire electromagnetic missiles and even summon crawlers. That's right. Every 30 seconds, you get 10 crawlers guaranteed. Fuck you, Baltimore. Shove it up your ugly ass. The melting point is a giant with a very dedicated role. It's the perfect hammer for the perfect nail. What if the nail is just too big? Fortress, my beloved, shoved the melting point out of the top spot of my beloved, and it's a Butte, an enormous artillery protection bot, a guard bot in a way, with two giant guns the size of trains on its shoulders. Eh, truly what's not to love. It fires somewhat slow, but each shot does massive damage, four times the DPS that the marksman does, even if it can only attack ground. But I think the fortress, despite being so cool, is not defined by its standard attacks, like the Vulcan and Melting Point is, but rather, its upgrades. A fortress bare bones is a bit mediocre. A fortress upgraded is a menace. You can give it a gigantic barrier bubble like the hacker, except it blocks even more damage. You can give it more range or double shot damage too as well. But I love the anti-air barrage, giving it anti-air capabilities and letting it deal with both threats. But it also can summon fangs. Remember how I said upgraded fangs were a crazy powerhouse? Well, the fangs it summons have the same upgrades as the ones you spawn. So you can bring a fortress out with a giant barrier bubble spawning 12 12 fangs every 28 seconds, allowing it to deal with all kinds of problems. It truly, a critical mass of fortresses can be reached, and the lumbering walking giants are deserving of the title, My Beloved. This is a boat. <laughs> ahoy, ahoy! A couple of fellow yachters saw your flyer at the boat store. Boat. Boat time. Boat boys. Ignore the thing over there that says Overlord. I don't know what that is. It's boat time is the final unit to discuss, and it is a flying giant. While much squishier than our other giants, Boop makes up for its sheer damage output. It puts out a high volume of splash damage DPS at medium or long ranges and can attack both air and ground. Boop is one of those jack of all trade units that's just pretty solid at everything you throw it at. The damage, it's consistent. It's got good splash, so anti-horde, and it's high damage, so it's good at the rest. Though much like the fortress, it's upgrades make it. It can summon those four wasps I mentioned earlier. It can also relocate with the jump drive. You can give it more range, higher AOE, health regen, or, or even a huge ground cannon to do tons of single target damage to ground units. It's not always the solution to your problem, but it might be the solution to all your problems. Boat Gang is fun and flexible, much like your mother last night. Wow, we that was a lot of mechs. God damn, that was a lot. Oh, it's so warm in here, I'm sweating. So the obvious question to ask now is, uh, how they work against one another. And, and well, you kind of half know the answer since you know what each mech does, but in practice, the game of rock, paper, scissors mech is a bit more nuanced because of course, various mechs fetch various prices and you don't have access to them all at one time. They need to be trained first, then bought, and training can get pretty expensive. Is it truly a good idea to spend 200 supply training a giant bot when it could so be easily taken down by a steel ball or melting point? Like your opponent has gone into crawler spam. Okay, they are filling the entire map with just these little griblies. What do you do? Well, arc light is your initial idea. It's cheap and effective. It's got great anti-horde, but they've fitted the area with marksmen's as well, so it could just get one shot. And I suppose you could bring a Vulcan, but that has the same problem. The answer is also possibly Mustangs, but they're so good I try to go away from that. So your enemy is spamming wasps. Uh, marksmen are bad fits for that because they're only single target. So you decide to build Mustangs to deal with them because Mustangs destroy everything. But they bought a jump drive, so they move the wasps to a totally different area and your Mustangs are stuck fighting a giant and doing no damage. You try to counter that and next thing you know they put a rhino on your flank. Your flank? Yeah, your flank. You have areas to the right and left of your zone by your towers. You can drop units in on that flank. However, it takes them a little while to load in the first time they're set up. So if they have anything near the flank, it can just be removed with relative ease. But if they don't, that's an easy backline attack directly into the enemy's towers. And taking out an enemy tower is really important because it shocks their entire army for a long time, massively reducing their speed, their damage output, and armor. It's crippling. 
and a great way to sweep through the lines with little to no resistance. Of course, when a flank is shown, you can then react to it or maybe get a specialist to help you out. Those specialists we mentioned earlier can give you lots of things, right? Extra supplies, every further round, maybe a support power like an orbital strike, tungsten rod, or my fucking nuke. Run! 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 Legalized nuclear bomb. What matters is that your opponent gets the exact same specialists. Now, maybe you wanted to take speed instead of the orbital strike. That's fine, but you have to remember that they could have taken the orbital strike, and you need to prepare for that. For the most part, when a round is over, you know exactly what your opponent can do. You see where their mechs are, you see what upgrades they have bought, what specialists they have unlocked, and they can unlock this round like yourself. So not only are you playing a game of counter what they are making, but you're playing a game of what will they do next? No plan survives contact with the enemy. You might lose a round to sledgehammer tanks and prepare a major counter utilizing storm callers, destroy them from a distance. Then when the round starts, they build a fucking boot. And the vine boom sound effect plays every single time the overlord murders your army. It's what makes Mechabellum so incredibly addicting. Because often, you know what you did wrong. There is rarely a time in which RNG is solely the cause of your own failure. Sure. Sometimes pathing or AI targeting can be weird, but that's part of the game. Every time I lose, I know why I lost. What they built, what powers they use, what upgrades they took. It's a scant few times I've ever had a game and said to myself, I genuinely don't know how I could have countered that. And the times I did say it, it's because the opponent built a force so well organized that I was just fighting someone way better than me. Every game, makes you want to get better, to play smarter, to level up your skill in a way that is all tactical and intelligent. It's one of the reasons I can just play this game for hours on end and time flies by. It's not APM and microplay and it's all this back and forth and massive movements. It's self-thinking, it's automatic, it's auto chess. The game doesn't demand my attention at all times and need me to commit to it forever. It's relaxing, it's fun, it's dynamic, and it's a great way for you to look at your clock and say, holy fuck, it's 4 a.m. I know we had discussion on Moonbreaker in the previous video, another fantastic strategy game that has been seeing a huge jump in player since that video, which I I've been like over the moon about. It's been awesome. It went from 15 players to like a few hundred and the community is, is active, it's exciting, it's, it's thriving. Now, I'm not as close with Mecha Bellum. The developers Game River and the publishers are called Paradox Arc and and they're not names I'm familiar with, I like either of them. I don't know who they are, where they're from or anything like that, but their patch notes are quite nice and they seem to have a good handle on the game. And even in early access, it's super cheap. It's $15. Its Steam chart is great too, with solid ratings, a meaty player count, and much like Moonbreaker, it doesn't need an astronomical player count for you to constantly get games. My nitpicks at the moment really come down to just some design decisions and the health. Like the UI for the game is pretty shit, honestly. At least in terms of the main menus, it's really thin and crappy, which might be changed in full release. But the other change I would like is that the health is just really low right now. They recently had a patch where the certain starter specialists had their health dropped, and the drop basically makes it feel like you go a round or two less per game than before. Now, each game normally takes around like 15 to 20 minutes, but now I think they just end way too fast. Since taking damage is dependent on the amount of mechs your opponent has alive at the end of a round, one good stomp, either because of a strong counter or utilizing support powers, might outright kill you way sooner than you'd expect. It just, it feels too punishing. Not only do I think this should be reversed, but I think health should be gained from the last time. Nobody should have under 4,000 health at all, and I think that makes for more dynamic games with more options in player skill. Oh, and a progression system. You like level up your little thing, but that's really it. I'd like some mech skins or something to show it off. Other than that, I think this game is a bright future. It's really addicting, extremely skill focused, it's casual or competitive, and they even run tournaments in house, which is fun as hell. If you like auto battlers, you like mechs, or just want to waste some time for $15, I'd highly recommend giving this a shot. It's a damn fun time. Thank you all for watching this video. Uh, the shirt, yes, this is the Forge King shirt. It is available not just as a shirt in black and white, but also as a hoodie in black and white, and for the first time ever, a tank 
top for the summer. And you can actually buy it as a poster if you want to hang the design on the wall. Uh, I commissioned this artwork from, from an artist, uh, I, and they did a really, really good job at really making exactly what I was hoping uh, for it to look like. So I'm super pleased with how it ended up. So you can check that all out in the description at orchidate.com. Uh, just click it down there. It says merch store, super easy to grab and uh, grab some stuff. It'll uh, it got tons of merch down there and we're always adding new things. This just happens to be the big highlight. Thanks so much for watching the video and uh, I'll see you in like a week or two. No, I won't. I will see you for a couple streams on the main channel playing Mechabellum. Bye-bye. Come on. Obviously you're a skater.